Welcome back, everybody. In the previous video, we have learned about the definition of a Markov chain. And in particular, we have learned what the Markov property is. And building on this, we will now start discussing basic properties of Markov chains. From the Markov property, it follows that a Markov chain is completely described by two quantities. The first one is these probabilities from the Markov property. So let's just call that x, y of t. That is the probability of going from x, or oh, I should write t here, to y at time t. It is usual to write where you come from first and where you go to second for these transition probabilities. And you need to be a bit careful if you write that in the form it appears in the Markov properties. And typographically, y is first and x is after, because the condition is written at the end. So that both this and that stands for the probability of going from x to y at time t. So that's one thing we need. And from the Markov property, we know that completely tells us what x t plus 1 does. And there is one other thing which is slightly less obvious, namely, if you look at this definition again, the only times it tells us something about are t plus 1, where t is actually, that was wrong here. It should have been n0 here. I just fixed the definition here. t equals 0 is the first time where we can say xt equals at. So the first time this definition tells us something about is time 1, 0 plus 1. And to describe the process x, we need to separately say what happens at time 0. So that's not described by the Markov property. And that's called the initial distribution. And that could be random. So we need the probabilities. Let's call them, I don't know, pi x, which is probability of x0 equals x. And there is one important special case, namely often the transition probabilities, the ones I wrote in 1, do not depend on t. So going from state x to state y has the same probability, whatever the number t of the step is. And in this case, the Markov chain is called time homogeneous, and that's the case we need here. So if p x y t equals p x y independent of t, then x t, t in n0, the Markov chain, is called time homogeneous. And all Markov chains in this module will be time homogeneous. So for now, from now on, we will drop the index t here, and we just write t p x y for the probability of going from x to y. And that notation is less standard, but let's write pi x for now for the probability of starting in x. Good. So there are now two cases. And if you paid attention, you may have noticed I cheated a bit. Namely, these expressions, probability of x0 being equal to x, or probability of xt plus 1 being equal to y, they make only sense if the xt are discrete. For discrete random variables, you can ask for the probability of individual values. For continuous random variables, you would need densities instead. And this difference we are going to discuss next. So you should keep in mind that here, that only applies to the discrete case. For the continuous case, notation will be slightly different. OK, so let's talk about the discrete case first. If the state space, S, is discrete, which means either a finite set or a countable infinite set. So it could be the integers, or it could be the numbers 1, 2, 3. Then we can characterize transition probabilities by actual probabilities. We can write pxy is the probability of x t plus 1 equals y, given the step before we've been at x. And I've just said we are considering time homogeneous Markov chains. So this expression does not depend on t. And we can write for all t in n0. And if s is finite, then we can write the pxy as a matrix. So let's do an example. If the state space is a 1, 2, 3, then we could have the transition probabilities as a matrix to be 1 half, 1 half, 0, say, and 0, 1 half, 1 half, and 1, 0, 0. And we follow the usual convention for matrices. So pxy corresponds to row x column y. So the probability 
of say going from 1 to 2 so x plus 1 is 2 given x is 1 that's p12 we said and we are in row 1 column 2 so it will be this entry which is one half and one thing we can do here to symbolize these numbers a bit is we can just do some transition graph. So if we do the states 1 to 3, if I represent these by these circles, then we see from going from 1 to 1, so staying in 1 has probability 1 half. Going from 1 to 2 has probability 1 half. Going from 1 to 3 never happens. Then going from 2 to 1 never happens. 2 to 2 has probability 1 half. And 2 to 3 also has probability 1 half. And the last row is a bit different, namely from state 3, we know we always go to state 1 with probability 1, so we go like this. Let's have a quick experiment and see how we can simulate paths from this Markov chain in R. Okay, so how can we do that? So the first thing we need is we need to get this transition matrix represented in R. For that, there is a command matrix, let me just bring up the help page, that takes normally three arguments. One is the numbers which will go in, then the number of rows and then the number of columns. So we do C, I fill in the numbers in a second, then three rows and three columns. That's what we need. And the numbers I can either put in by row or by column that's selected by the by row argument. And if we do it by row, we can make that look quite similar to how it looked on the slides. We can say one half, one half, zero for the first row and zero, one half, one half for the second row, and one, zero, zero for the third row. So that gives us a matrix, and we can try that out. That did work. One half, one half, zero for the first row, zero, one half, one half for the second row, one, zero, zero for the third row. Now we need the initial distribution also, and that is a vector of length three, because there are three states, which just has the probabilities in. So let's say we start with equal probabilities, so we do one third, one third, one third. Great. And now what we need to do is we need to first sample x0 separately using the probabilities in pi. And there is a function sample, which does what we need. So arguments are here. x is a vector of one or more elements from which to choose, or a positive integer, see details. And here it says, if x has length one, the sampling takes place from one to x. So we can plug in three here and we'll get a random number in the range one to three. The next argument size is how many numbers we want. And we want just one. If we do that, that already nearly works. We got two. And if we run just this command again, you see we get sometimes one, sometimes two, and sometimes three. And the only thing which makes no difference here, but is required for the general case, is we need to plug in the probabilities. So prop is a vector of probability weights for obtaining the elements of the vector being sampled. So we do prop equals pi. Since I chose equal weights, that will make no difference. Just to try it out, I put 0, 1, 0 here. Then we should always get a 2. That also works. So let's reverse the change and start with uniform distribution. So that was the easy bit. Now for the actual Markov chain, we need to use the transition matrix. So the transition matrix tells us if we are in state i, then we look in row i, and inside this row, the numbers tell us the probabilities for the next state. How do we do that? We'll say xi is the current state, and then the probability for the next state is matrix p row xi, I believe that works like this. P2, for example, gives the second row. That is correct. And then we need to, after that, apply what we have just done here. Namely, we sample again from the numbers 1 to 3, but this time the probabilities are not pi, but they are p next, which is the probabilities for the next state. So let's pop that in a loop and do 10 steps of that. We should probably print these steps. So cut xi and... I want these strings with no spaces in between, and I need a line ending. I think that may work. And if I run that, then I get 3, 1, 2, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. And the one thing which we can see is correct is we know if we have a 3, the next state must be 1. That worked here, and worked here, and worked here. 
And for the other states, there's some randomness. For example, one can be followed either by one or by two. Here it's followed by two. Here again, here again. I would think that's coincidence, and sometimes we get ones. And similarly, two can either be followed by two or by three. Here it's a two, here it's a three. So I would argue that is correct. Now, the last thing I want to do is to just sample a bit longer segment of this Markov chain. So n is, say, do 100 steps. x is the vector where I want to store the values. So I just can write xi equals xi. And if I run the whole thing, then x is now a long pass. Ah, so first we see something has gone wrong. And if you have paid attention, you have already spotted what has gone wrong. I see here only the first elements seem to be filled in. And the reason that has happened is I never changed this 10 to n. So if I run that again, we get a whole path of the Markov chain. So let's do plot x, type both. But what we see is the process jumps between the states 1 to 3. And you see every time we are at 3, it seems to go straight down. That happens regularly. And I would actually there are probably more points at levels 1 and 2 that is caused by 1 and 2 having a chance of the process staying there, whereas 3 is always left immediately. So that happen less often. If we do hist x, we see that confirmed. So 1 and 2 are approximately 40 each, and 3 is about 20. So let's not worry about this and go back to our theory. So looking back at this matrix, we see a few property of transition matrices. So P is called a transition matrix. The first one is the rows, say, where we come from. So row 1 is all probabilities coming from state 1. And since coming from state 1, we need to go somewhere. These probabilities need to add up to 1. So we have 1 half, 1 half is 1. Same thing, state 2. Everything starting in state 2 is in row 2. So these also need to add up to 1. Finally, from state 3, we always go to 1. So here's the 1. So one property of a transition matrix is the rows add up to 1. But that's not true for the columns. If you check the columns, the first one and the third one do not add up to 1. So the rows have a special meaning. A transition matrix P satisfies two properties. One is trivial, it's probability. So the numbers must be greater or equal to 0 because there are no negative probabilities. And B is what we just said. If we stay inside a row and then sum over all columns, then we get 1 for all rows x. And this is what the transition matrix looks like. One can show for every matrix which has these properties, say, as a Markov chain, which has this matrix as its transition matrix. And similarly, an initial distribution pi satisfies its probabilities again. So it's pi of x bigger or equal to 0 for all x in S. And it's a probability vector. We need to start somewhere. So sum over all x in S pi of x must equal 1. So that's what an initial distribution looks like in the discrete case. Now, let's just talk a bit about the continuous case. In this case, probabilities like xt plus 1 equals y make no sense anymore. So that expression we can write, but it makes no sense because this probability will be always zero because for a continuous distribution, like the normal distribution, the probability of taking a fixed value always equals zero. So what we need to do to fix this is we need to ask about sets here. Is that what you do? So we ask what's the probability of xt plus 1 being in a set A given we have just been in x. And there are technical complications, but here I will assume there is a density, so we should be able to write that as an integral over A of a density for jumps from x to y dy. And this p is a, fun is a density as a function of y. And there is the other argument x that states where do we come from. So properties are, first thing, p x y is positive because densities are positive for all x y in S. And then, similar to the condition we had here, densities have the property that they integrate to 1. So we have integral p x y dy equals to 1 for all x in S, because that says what is the density for the next step if we were currently in x. And the process needs to go somewhere, and that is reflected in the integral over the next step over y being equal to 1. So that's what 
die Transition Density das. Transition Density. And similarly, the initial distribution we describe with the density, which is sometimes called the initial density. So we assume that the probability of x0 being in a set A, that's how we do it now, equals integral over A of pi of x dx. And pi of x being a density is positive for all x in S and integral pi of x dx equals 1. That is what makes pi a probability density. And you see that lines up quite nicely with what we did for the discrete case, only this and this sum has now turned into an integral. We write the arguments of the transition density in brackets because it is a function and not matrix elements. And the same for pi, we write pi of x as a function rather than pi of x as elements of a probability vector, but the rules are the same. And from now on, I will just restrict my discussion to the discrete case, and I leave it for you to read up in the book on the continuous case, but it will be all analogous to each other, so there will be nothing new, it will just be new notation. So, this covers the basics, and in the next video we will learn one more thing, namely we will discuss stationary distributions of Markov chains, and we will heavily use these when we do Markov chain Monte Carlo estimates later. So, see you in the next video.